Okay, the meeting is being recorded. Yep. Oh, sorry. Yep. <laughs> Thank you, Stephanie. Um, okay, uh, very good. Welcome, everybody, um, to the uh, May 26, 2023 meeting of the Town of Amherst Solar Bylaw Working Group. Appreciate everybody being here. Um, and um, yeah, we don't have uh, uh, Chris uh, Bestrup with us today. She's on vacation. So uh, we'll have a little bit different of an agenda, uh, but um, which has been circulated uh, in the packet, which I'm getting in front of me now. Um, so thanks. Um, okay, so uh, first up on the agenda is to uh, review uh, and vote on the minutes. We have um, welcome Martha and welcome Bob as well. Great. Um, we have, um, I think we're caught up with minutes except for the last meeting now. So uh, for the meet, uh, we have minutes uh, to review and approve if, uh, if we wish. Uh, for the last meeting, May 12th. Um, have people had a chance to look at that and any questions or concerns or edits um, or a motion to move? Um, Janet, yep. I had an add, a sentence to add um, on the second page um, on the section that said applicability and definitions. It's like right. the last. And so I was hoping to add um, just because I thought it was a good idea, is um, the sentence suggestions included um, a solar overlay district and um, the John Lane basalt mine as a possible site for a large array. Yeah, those those are my suggestions. So the, I so. Any objections on that? I do recall those comments. Um, Stephanie, is that sufficient for you to, to add, um, or do you need language from Janet? You're Sorry, Janet, if you could, um, just send that to me. Sure. And I'll, I'll get it into the minutes okay. as long as people vote to amend it. I can do that, right? Yeah. Okay. All right. Any other, um, thoughts or edits or do I hear a motion to accept those minutes as Martha. amended as yeah. amended yes i i move to accept the minutes from our last meeting as amended i will second All right okay and then we need a voice vote in no particular order so please be sure to unmute yourself corcoran yes Breger. yes hanner yes mcgowan yes Brooks. I have to abstain. I wasn't there. Okay. Mm -hmm. We still have a quorum, so yep. they're okay. approved. Super. Thank you, everybody. Um, okay. Um, next up on the agenda is uh, staff updates, uh, which would be for Stephanie now. Sure. Um, so uh, I did send you all the GZA report. Um, I don't have a lot to say about it, only because Adrian did a presentation and I think she presented most of the content. So really it's just the content that she presented, but with the supporting graphics. So um, so you have that now. I wanted to give you an update about the mapping process. I spoke to Mike Warner, who is our GIS. I, um, sorry. Yep. Sure. So Go sorry, ahead. Stephanie. Um, no worries. Can I interrupt for a moment. We didn't Absolutely. designate this the uh, minute taker for today. Oh, right. Um, and apologize for that. Um, so let me look at my magic spreadsheet. Um, Dan did it last time. Uh, Dan did it last time, right? Yeah. And then, um, uh, and Martha went out of order um, and did it, I think, the time before th that. Uh, so we're down to Jack, who's, who's not here today. Um, and next up is Janet. <laughs> um, are you okay? Okay, very good. Thank you. Okay, sorry, Stephanie. That's okay. No uh, worries. Continue. Yeah. Um, 
so um, the mapping exercise, uh, I just wanted to let you know that I spoke with Mike Warner. He has um, been working on it. I, I, as I mentioned, he is in, was in the middle of a very large town scale um, effort. So um, he did. He has gotten to it, though. He is um, incorporating some of the information. I, I wanted to make sure that he included um, having the prime agricultural soils mapping that the state has done, that he had that available. Um, there are some limitations to what he can provide, so it's not going to be everything. Um, he's going to do what he can, but I did say that that was a specific layer you all wanted to see, so that option will be included as um, something you can turn on. So in any case, I'm hoping that we will have some kind of a draft of it later today. Um, and I think Duane is a final technical review. Um, we should meet with him for our final technical review of that mapping piece, just to make sure it's what we said we were going to provide. And then I will make that available to the group uh, when Mike sends me the final version. So I would anticipate it's within a week or so. I think we should get it within next, you know, by next week at the latest. And we can meet earlier just to make sure that, you know, it is what we had asked for. Great. Um, yeah, and I will uh, point out before we go to the other uh, comments um, is that time permitting today, um, uh, we have an item where I thought it would be helpful to um, sort of discuss amongst ourselves even before seeing the maps of what are the types of questions, queries uh, that we might want to um, Posit and 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 analyze uh, with the map mapping tool that we um, will be in receipt of. Um, uh, uh, just going into it and then and then having uh, being being prepared in that way, um, and um, uh, so I thought that would be helpful uh, toward, towards the end of today. Um, okay, um, and Stephanie, if you can just clarify, then um, is this is the intent? of this tool is that it will be um, user friendly enough for us to use uh, either uh, individually uh, or together collectively at, during this uh, during the working group meeting. Absolutely. Uh, that was the whole that yeah. it, that was one of its purposes. It was also something for the general public to be able to utilize in case they were interested in solar on their property, on their house at their business, you know, it was just the idea was, what do we have that's feasible? I mean, and again, it was to sort of try to eliminate um, some of the things that might prevent solar. So areas where it's blacked out are areas where obviously um, it's not potentially feasible right now um, based on various reasons. Um, so for instance, conservation land. Uh, or or um, endangered species habitat. Those have been blacked out so that people can see automatically what's left and then they can sort of go from there to sort of, again, address whether it's a feasible development in that location or not. But I will also say that, you know, every, all of this comes with the caveat that everything is site specific and just because it shows up on the map um, doesn't even mean that it's absolutely a given that it can be developed because there's still permitting processes that people need to go through. And, you know, there may be other, you know, there are other reasons why they may not be able to develop solar on that property. So. Great. Um, uh, but, but for a, uh, a non GIS, and I'm not sure if any, we have any GIS experts or users on, uh, in this group, but, um, I'm not, um, but it, um, would it allow a user to do some queries like, you know, I want to see land that is um, not under conservation, um, but in parcels greater than five acres, just as a random example? I don't know how specific a query you'll be able to do with this, again, because this is something that Mike is building and there might be sort of, you, you might be able to look at it. Um, sort of on a parcel by parcel basis, but I'd have to, once Mike finishes the tool, I think I think that's what that technical meeting will be helpful to sort okay. of find out is, you know, Mike will probably give us a, a very quick run through initially just to make sure it's kind of the things we were looking for. But then I think either I or Mike 
probably me, will um, then give a presentation to this group yes. on how to use the tool, which will then be available to the public as well in the recording so that people can have an idea of how to use the tool. But it should be pretty user friendly. I mean, it's yeah. literally a base map. Yeah. You can select a parcel and then you can turn layers on and off over that parcel so you can get a better idea. And one thing Mike and I did talk about was that um, with the aerial, you know, sometimes people think it's it's easy to have the aerial view on, but it's actually in this case more um, challenging to have the aerial view on. So it's going to show up as kind of the base um, on the base community map. Uh, I'm forgetting which layer that is. I apologize, but just the sort of property boundaries. Um, so it won't show up. It's not an aerial photograph. It'll just be sort of like a mapping, yeah. visualizes a mapping layer, and then you can turn on the aerial layer. So it won't automatically come up with the aerial layer and that'll probably make it easier. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Um, all right, uh, thank you. I think Janet that. has a question. Yep, yep. I'm uh, Janet, yep. Um, I had the impression from um, past meetings less that Adrian Dunk was gonna come and give us a presentation on the final report. And then I'm personally less interested in the sections on the survey, because I think we covered that pretty well. But um, I would like to have her come back and talk about how things were sectioned. So, you know, and, and you know, part of this is, you know, I, you know, I, I went through the map and stuff and I was thinking, okay, how do I get a closer look at this area? You know, something's white, something's green, something's like, you know, some different color, like how do I get into that? And then also I had questions about like what open land was or bare land or lawns, like how does that get delineated? So I just, how they kind of, how that was grouped was unclear to me. And how could I say, oh, you know, what's open land that's not being farmed or, you know, what's bare land? Like I was trying to think of what bare land I knew of in Amherst versus, you know, a grassland and things like that. So I think it would be helpful maybe if she came in and just showed us basically how we can use and look at and how they divided up these different sections that I don't think our IT person will know. So- yeah, I don't know that she'll be able to do that because at this point, I think we've expended our grant, our funding for for the project. We've kind of wrapped things up with them. So um, I think if you had a specific question, though, I would be happy to, um, if anyone has questions in the group, feel free to send them to me and I can just shoot them to her um, and ask mm -hmm. her for clarification. And that can be made available to the group at an, at the next meeting, but I don't think she's going to be coming in for another presentation. That was the presentation that she gave was pretty much the presentation to the group. So that was just on the, the survey, though, not on these. I mean, the assessment is the meat and bones of this this contract, as far as I can tell. So, and then is there a way for me without to look on, at the map and get it? You know, sec. I know where I am. Can I like focus in without? I, mean, I just think it, you know the report and the assessment are two separate things. The report is only about the community outreach. The assessment is the mapping itself. That map is separate from that assessment. I mean, I'm sorry, from that report. They're two separate projects, really. Okay. They're related, but they're separate. So the the report has nothing to do with um with anything about um I mean, it just sort of identifies the process that they went through, but there's nothing, there's no sort of um, map. I mean, there's no, no, there's a map, but there's no, but there's no, um, she, they didn't do this to, um, they just sort of summarized basically what, what the mapping exercise was and what it came up with, but there's no like, um, um, what am I trying to say? There's no uh, analysis, if you will, greater analysis. It's just a very straightforward, you know, this is what we did, this is what we got. There was no um, theoretical investigation of anything. It was just very straightforward. I, I, I think I'm just lost, but I mean, I looked at the section that includes the map, the mapping section, and it has maps on it, and it describes how it's divided things up. And it wasn't clear to me where you know the bare land was the lawns were like i is there another map that i could go on to and get that level of detail on that isn't in the report I, everything she provided everything in the report so i don't think there's another level of mapping that 
was provided. So I'm not sure. I mean, did you, if you read through the port, I, I would have to say that she probably somewhere has that identified what that is. So if you haven't read through the whole thing, maybe if you do that and then have specific questions, I would be happy to share those with her. Well, but maybe, she's not going to come in and do another presentation. Okay. So maybe I could come in maybe with you or Chris to sort of like. Sure. Work it. Happy to. Yeah. Okay. Happy to. Absolutely. <clears throat> be happy to do that. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, Martha. Yeah, I think I think the conversation then, Stephanie, your replies kind of answered my question, but I think that what would be helpful then is is perhaps uh, when the time comes to have Mike Warner uh, actually come in and, and maybe, you know, wait till uh, Chris is back and so on. And so Stephanie and, and, and Mike and Chris probably all together would be able to uh, answer Janet's questions and all our questions and, and present the, the, the basics of, of, the, of the map. So that that sounds good, because I, too, was sure. confused by the report in, in sort of, oh, my, is, is this all there is in terms of the mapping? So, OK, thank you. Um, Janet, again. Are we, I know we're going to talk about this later, but I was I don't know. Are we going to talk about this more later, right? Because I was just going to make the suggestion that we might want to be in person with a huge map on the wall because my computer screen is not not generous. So anyway, that's it. Um, well, are you talking about the mapping exercise with the with uh, yeah. Mike Warner and so, so forth? Um, um, I'm not sure. Well, why don't we why don't we um, start off with doing it by Zoom and and see how it works. Uh, if if we want to um, do a meeting, and if it's if it's feasible and um, kosher, if you will, uh, to do to do actually do an in person meeting uh, or, or some sort of um, working group um, to look at the um, uh, look at the maps together uh, on on a larger screen. Um, and, and and quote unquote play around with it um then um, then i think we can work with stephanie to um schedule something like that but i, I think it would have to be uh, i'm not sure how that would work in terms of our meetings whether it would be a meeting or or uh and open to the public and so forth um um but I, we can work we could work with uh, stephanie on that and chris okay. but let's let's first see how what we learn, what we can learn, um, and uh, and to the extent to which we we um, feel like we need to um, uh, come together in, in a, on a larger screen. I think, yeah, I think when we actually present the overview of the mapping tool itself, that some of the questions you have will those would be the times to ask those questions. I mean, it's not even done yet, so honestly, it's hard for me to answer um, anything specific because I haven't seen the finished product. So, um, and I know the report references the base map. It doesn't, it only references the base map, but again, I think some of that will be clearer when we have the final product. Great, okay, uh, thank you. Um, any uh, other staff updates or, or is that it, uh, Stephanie? Um, That's it, funny. for yes. now. Thank you. <laughs> um, all right, great, thank you. Um, any updates from uh, members of other committees um, that um, would be helpful for this group to hear? Yep, uh, Je uh, Janet is muted. <laughs> um, could, is, I don't know if this is for Stephanie or Dwayne, but could there be an update for us on the community aggregation? I'm gonna get the language right. Is um, community choice aggregation thank you is that would is, be me oh, okay i heard you giving that at ecac and i thought it'd be useful mm -hmm. for us to hear too um sure uh just that um we are beginning the community comment period june 1st it will run through june 30th um there is a community presentation that our consultant mass power choice will lead on june 6th which is i think 
I want to say a Tuesday. I'm sorry. I don't know which day of the week, but it is June 6th and it will be held from 6.30 p.m. until 8 p.m. And it will involve three communities, Northampton, Amherst, and Pelham, which are the three communities that are working together to put together this community choice aggregation effort. Um, and so that will be an opportunity at that time for people to um, basically voice their support or concerns um, just gives people an opportunity to um, to respond to the idea of of the aggregation so we're not committing to anything yet there we haven't even submitted the application this comment period is required by the department of public utilities in order um, for the application process to move forward they need to know that the community is in support okay Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, anybody else? All right. So let's move on to um, the nexus statements. Um, and um, uh, what we've circulated in the uh, in the packet is a. Um, some additional drafting um, that um, I did and Martha provided, uh, and then uh, some comments that have been integrated um, from Bob, I believe. Though I don't, I'm not sure if that's in the in the in the uh, in the version that was circulated, um, but. Um, uh, and what I'd like to sort of uh, put forward is a, is a uh, going through those next nexus statements and getting people's uh, input on those. Um, and, and then there's a, a couple steps to follow, which I don't know if we are best to do live or 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 I'm happy to sort of take it back and work on it. But that is trying to connect together in a way that makes um, logical. <laughs> uh since uh the the nexus statements that that i've put together that martha's put together uh in a way that flows naturally um and consistently uh but then also um to go back also to the statements that uh, chris had put together um and we discussed and reviewed uh last time and integrate to the extent there were we need to integrate some of that stuff as well uh, to then come up with one uh, more coherent um, and flowing uh, set of uh, of nexus uh, a, a set of nexus statements that sort of um, set us up well or sets up the bylaw well uh, in terms of uh, what our uh, purpose, intent, and and uh, um, um, direction is that we're looking to go forward in with the with the bylaw. Um, so does that sound okay with folks? Janet. Um, so I read the different nexus statements and then also um, the email that just came in. And I think in a way, I feel like we've lost like the idea of the nexus statement, which is a term I hate, but you know, cause it's, it's sort of confusing. Like we already have a, a paragraph in the beginning of the bylaw that says, here's the intent and here's the problem. Like the solar, you know, obviously climate change problem. And the nexus statements, um, you know, so I went back and read Tracer Lane, um, and the purpose of the nexus statement is to whatever we decide we're regulating, right, in the terms of solar, we need to sort of justify it and connect it to public health, safety, and welfare. And when you look at the Supreme Judicial Court decision in Tracer Lane, it's not enough to say, oh, we decided to do dual use, required dual use, or, you know, a 50-foot buffer, because that's, you know, that's important to public health and safety and welfare of Amherst. We need to give a list of reasons that are reasonable. So here's what we're regulating, here are the reasons why, and here's how they connect to public health, safety, and welfare. And so I have cheerfully volunteered to make up those reasons or, you know, for, we, that's what lawyers do, right? And so those justifications, but I don't think we really need to, um, have a formal statement about the problem of climate change and 
you know, what we need, you know, the solar, you know, the, the, the town, you know, I don't think we need to sort of lay out the whole problem. What we really need to do is decide what are we regulating and what's the just what's the connection between that regulation and public health, safety, and welfare. And so I kind of, um, you know, and I, I pulled out a, a great quote from the S SJC. So I think that I took Chris Brestrup's draft as saying, if we want to regulate solar, have restrictions on forested land or agricultural land, here are the reasons why. And she literally had a list of reasons why. And then Martha took that and kind of put it in more, you know, prettier form and maybe more comprehensive form. So I think that I would sort of defer this discussion until we figure out what we're regulating and how. And so if we want, you know, it's a 60 foot or a 200 foot setback or a 20 foot setback, if we are requiring a buffer, the SJC really wants to know how that connects to public health, safety and welfare. And then I also went back and I read the minutes from the town attorney whose name completely is, I can't remember. Um, and he was saying, put in those reasons in detail. And so that's what I think the nexus, it's not like, it's not a statement about the whole bylaw, but with each thing that we're regulating, we have to specifically say, you know, the reason why we are putting this glare section is, is so you don't blind people. <laughs> so, or there's like traffic safety. There's, I, I remember Athol saying, you know, it can't be, you can't come around the curve and get hit by these things. Well, that's a public safety issue. You know, glare is dangerous to drivers or, you know, someone sitting in their house and they're being baked you know, kind of thing. And so I think that's what the, ne the nexus statement isn't like an overarching statement for the bylaw, but it's going to be a series of reasons why we're doing that. And I don't know where it belongs. And I think that's a good question for the town attorney. Should we do a long whereas clause? Like, whereas we decide to regulate X for these reasons, and that's how it connects to public health, like say, you know, food, fresh food is good for public health. Um, or if we had to say it like as a little prefatory thing to the paragraph where the regulation is. But so I kind of would love to defer this discussion or the like reasons for the neck, you know, what's the connection to when we get to really specific, like what are we regulating? Does that make sense to people? Because, mm -hmm. you know, and, and then I was gonna read, you know, um, so in Tracer Lane, like the final statements of the SJC, like all municipalities, Waltham maintains the discretion to reasonably restrict the magnitude and placement of solar energy systems. An outright ban of large scale solar energy systems in all but two, one or 2% of a municipality's land area, however, restricts rather than promotes the legislative goal of promoting solar. In the absence of reasonable, a reasonable basis grounded in public health, safety or welfare, such prohibition is impermissible under the provision. So, we have to say we're regulating this and this is how why and this is how it promotes public health or protects public health you know what i mean and so i don't think we need to spend a whole bunch of time right now until we figure out what we're regulating and and why yeah. is that that's a lot to say um i i would agree and uh, to some extent in that um i i, I was even when we were discussing it last meeting, I was a little bit um, unclear about the differentiation between the um, intent section of the regulation and then the nexus section of the regulation. And I'm not sure legally or technically whether they need to be separated because they seem fairly um, connected with each other. Mm -hmm. um, um, so I, I, at least when I was doing this drafting to, to add some language, which I called sort of nexus statements around the climate emergency, um, and, and commitments and so forth. Um, I was writing them sort of with a dual purpose, one in terms of the intent, but also, uh, with regard to, um, uh, how they influence, um, our 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 zoning and our and our restrictions or lack thereof. Mm -hmm. um, um, I, I'm a little bit concerned about you know thinking that we need a nexus statement for every zoning restriction we put in because then it's like almost every every um, yeah. 
the paragraph needs a, re a reason for public health, safety, and welfare to go along with it, uh, which I don't think is is doable or 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 or, or the way to go in, in sort of these nexus statements. So they they're kind of straddling being somewhat broad, but also uh, mm. somewhat um, specific. Also, um, I guess I would push back in terms of. Um, you know, while zoning, from what I, you know, what I've learned is more about restriction than um, than um, than than uh, allowing things. Um, I think um, I think it's really important in the nexus statements, if that's what we'll call them, uh, <clears throat> to be really strong on the um, the reason why we um, because it's also a reason why we're developing these zoning bylaws and and the levels of restrictions is because um uh uh you know well, well obviously food and so forth is is public health so is um addressing the climate emergency um uh satisfies i think um satisfies or at least what i think we should argue <laughs> uh, satisfies the importance or, or the impact on um Public health and welfare. Um, so I wouldn't I wouldn't want to shy away from those uh, yeah, we, in the next we, statements uh, as as well. We don't have to justify no restriction. So if we had said, okay, this is our solar overlay district, you know, blah 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 blah, you know, you know, because we have these we have these things in zoning all the time. It's like this is our residential district, build houses, right? You know, that's where it can go. And so we could say here's our overlay district and we can build by site plan review or whatever. So that's, we don't have to explain why we're letting the solar do, and we don't have to explain everything we regulate in terms of solar because, you know, even this SJC is, you know, like, you know, the, the was it the religious institutions and educational institutions has very, like, we're only allowed to regulate, you can't do the interior or the use of it, but you can you can regulate through zoning the bulk, the height of structures, yard sizes, areas, setback, open space, parking, and building coverage requirements. So even on the much more strict things, those are like, you know, that's like the, you know, how far, how close it is. So the SJC is going to let that go through because they're already letting that go through for religious institutions and educational institutions and daycares. But when we're saying something else, we need to say, you know. You know, I don't know. Farming could, is health, right? But it's also economic development, and you know, whatever. So we can just an economic development is part of the health, the public welfare of our town. So I think that my question for the town attorney is, when do we need to point it out? You know, and then, but the first question is, what are we regulating? And I don't think we're kind of there yet. I mean, we're sort of talking about dual use. We're talking about what to do with the forest. We were talking about whether we want to do set asides. But I think until we get there, we don't need the, the next statement is really saying, here's the connection to public health. Here's the connection to public safety. Here's welfare. The fact is, and the thing is, is that we don't have to say, you know, I mean, we're obviously always balancing, right? That's what we're trying to do. But I don't think we have to say we're regulating, you know, we're requiring dual use because there's a climate emergency and we want to be able to eat. I, I don't, that the climate emergency stuff could be in the intent or the where is clause, like here's what, how we got here, unfortunately, but if we don't need it in the nexus statement about, because we wouldn't, don't keep, you know, I mean, the, the SJC isn't asking us to say why we're allowing solar because it's, you know, the legislator is telling us put it in. So I just think it's okay. kind of, yeah. I, I, okay, we, we can discuss that, but um, I, I don't know if I see any harm in having them in there. And I think um, I'm also, uh, obviously, we have several audiences. One is sort of the developers, so they know what the rules and regulations are with regard to the zoning. Uh, but also, I think we want to, um, you know, write write you know either intent or whereases or nexus statements that also address um, justify our draft uh, by law uh, to the town council when it goes there, as well as to the constituents as a whole. Um, yes. I guess I would. Would I, I don't know if we can or would want to. Um, obviously, the 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 SJC decision and the state rules allow for solar um, uh, solar development, um, uh, unless restricted by zoning, in ways that 
meet the, the SJC, um, but um, I wouldn't. Um, it, 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 I, I wouldn't. I, I don't think that means we don't need to mention uh, the or helpful to mention the um, benefits uh, of public health and safety and so forth associated with solar development. Um, but let me move on to yeah. Dan. <laughs> yeah. Dan. Yeah. You're muted if you're. Are you calling me or sorry? Yeah. Um, yeah, I like I like that point about how this nexus statement shouldn't be finalized at this point because we don't know what um what we're gonna need to put in it yet. Um it makes a lot of sense to me to just make this a living document that we develop alongside the rest of the bylaws. We're writing sections of the bylaw where you go, okay, hold on, why are we regulating this? This is the reason why, okay, put it in a nexus statement, you know, just have the two side by side. Right. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a good a good point uh, to really view this as a living document. I, I would agree if we if we decide to write a, a, a paragraph about zoning certain things and we think that is that deserves to have a nexus statement, uh, then um, then um, this will be a living document for sure. Yeah. Okay, uh, Martha. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I agree that it's probably premature now to try to wordsmith and get a perfect uh, section until we've we've actually done the regulations. The way I would envision is sort of a, maybe you'd call it a preface or something or an introduction to the bylaw that would have maybe just three paragraphs that would first have a brief uh, paragraph on, you know, yes, there's a climate crisis and what that is specifically, you know, excess of greenhouse gas emissions that we must do something about. Uh, one uh, brief paragraph that relates to the to the Commonwealth's uh, master plans here, because after all, we are part of Massachusetts and presumably we're working in concert with them. One just paragraph that uh, mentions the CARP and the town's master plan, because they're both well-documented and that they generally agree with the um, state's goals and the overall response to the climate things. And then, you know, those are the three general paragraphs and then go on, you know, as we see the need to just to, you know, discuss the health, safety and welfare of the, of the specific uh, things. Uh, and that, as we say, we have to do as a living document and fill in as we go along with, you know, the forest, the farmland, the, you know, whatever else we're, we're regulating. All right, and I think I think that's um, um, we have the structure of that um, at this point with some of the drafting that we've done. Um, all right, Janet. So I like I like the idea of having that part of the conversation as we go on, and you know I kept on thinking about these kind of the connection or the nexus language is kind of an inoculation, like we're trying to like. You know, the SJC is the thinking court or the appeals court. They, they're the judges that sit down and they're like, how does the law apply? And so the district courts and superior courts a little less conscientious. And so I kept on thinking, I've done a fair amount of appeal work. And it's like, you know, we need to justify this under these three things. And what's the connection? What are the reasons for that? And so as we go along, I could provide that and people could come up with reasons like, how does this promote public welfare? and health and safety and stuff like. So I think it's a good idea maybe to keep it like as two running columns, you know, as we're regulating this and we're coming closer, we can say, okay, here we justify it. And it's just like inoculating it from a lawsuit and a successful lawsuit. You know, we had, you know, the town thought about these things. They they picked, they made decisions. They weren't unduly regulating solar. So like it can't be anywhere. And, you know, here's here's what they're doing, you know? And so I think, That'd be great. I, I like the idea of just keeping that in mind and keeping kind of a running list of reasons on both sides. So I also hate the idea of like wordsmithing a document in a large group, but that's personal and separate. <laughs> yep. I, yeah, I, I'm with you there. Yep. Um, um, I'm not a camel. Um, okay. Um, well, what's the thought? in terms of um, 
making use of our time today uh, with regard to the draft drafting that's been done to date. Um, Do we want to go through, not wordsmith, but review what we've drafted so far um, and get some comments on on those, uh, on what we have, um, not wordsmithing, but just sort of general uh, sense, um, uh, or, um, or leave this as a living document that we'll just continue to work on and, and pull it together at the end. Hmm. Janet. I would kick it down the road and kick it to Christine more. And so make it, making her sort of the, the center of, you know, comments and stuff like that. And, you know, I'm, it's always good to give somebody an assignment when they're not at the meeting, but just, you know, like, <laughs> um, you know, she is already sort of, you know, at the seat of a lot of the drafting. And so maybe sending comments to her, but I, I would love not to talk about this in super detail now. That was good to me. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, I'm not not opposed to that. Um, any any other thoughts on that? Um, I guess what I wouldn't mind from, and maybe Christine is the best to to, to uh, walk us through this is um, uh, sort of look as we were talking about before, looking up a little bit at a at a higher level in terms of where. Uh, the structure of this presentation with regard to um, um, where these different, the, this whole thing is about balancing, <laughs> as far as I see, uh, uh, um, and how, and I, I guess I'm a little bit uncomfortable with suggesting that the nexus statements, which is kind of where the lawyers may focus, um, is strictly on you know, more, more focused on, on the, um, um, protections that we might, or the regulations we might ha have and restrictions we might have and, and, and point out, you know, the public health, safety, and welfare, uh, of, um, the important things to, in Amherst in terms of forests and soils and farms and losing track in, in some way of the importance of to public health, safety, and welfare of uh, of um, getting rid of all our fossil fuels uh, yeah. uh, and 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 contributing to the state's yeah. master plan, yeah. uh, um, and and that that doesn't seem to be the balance that we want to strike, um, uh, and that the town would want to strike. Um, so I'm a little bit um, uncomfortable with um, uh, you know diff uh, separating these things into two different categories um, where where we're trying to to um, purposefully confront this balancing of, of public health and welfare and, and uh, public health and welfare um, on both of these issues simultaneously. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, you know, again, I think we have good language. I'm just not sure where it all goes okay. uh, and, and connects together. Mm -hmm. um, um, yeah. Uh, Martha, I think first. Yeah, Dwayne, I think I'm. I'm not too worried. I think it will sift out and sort itself out as as we go along and get the the draft of of all our specific sections done. I think we will be able to, uh, you know, eventually get the balance right for the, the introduction or preface. But you know, I I will say that right now, the most urgent ways that we need to reduce fossil fuel use are transportation and buildings. I mean, if you look at the state- Which means a lot more el electricity generation. Yes, yes. I mean, so that means long-term, like by the by 10 years from now, that's when we're gonna really need, you know, the, the electricity generation to come to the forefront. But the, the most immediate crisis I see is the 47% of our state greenhouse gas emissions that come from transportation, the 27% or whatever from buildings. And as I recall from the last year that they had the plot, it was just at that time, just 19% of the greenhouse gas emissions were from electricity. So yes, it's all in the balance. And we do have to emphasize that solar has an important role, but 
but I think it'll all fall out as as we go through, and I think we'll be able to uh, strike a good balance in our introduction finally when we get to the end of this uh, process. So that would just be my two cents here. Janet? So I wonder if um, maybe Chris and I could talk to the town attorney about where should the nexus statements go? Because I that was one of my questions, because I, I, I can't remember if I talked to Chris or in my many hours of coughing and thinking that I just thought I'd talk to Chris, but about whether it should be a whereas clause, which I remember from town meeting. So at least it's a justification or, you know, I think in the minutes, the attorney was like, put it in the provision. And so I think it'd be good to talk to him at length or some very specifically, like, where should this language show up? Because, you know, even in the bylaw, like in sections, you know, there's like a little prefatory like intent. And then, you know, they might even in the very specific provision say, you know, you know, why that is being done. But I don't think it's usually that wordy. And so I don't know if the wordy stuff goes into the whereas clause, you know, where it's like, we are doing this because of the terrible climate, you know, and, you know, and all the health emergency and all that stuff. I mean, I think we just need to get better sense from him where and how this should show up. So I'd be happy to talk with him, with Chris, and then report back to the group. Uh, I'm not sure what Stephanie thinks about that, but um, if that is the case, I'd like to be part of that as well. I was just going to say, I think actually um, it would probably make sense for people to sort of have specific questions for the attorney and funnel them through Chris. And I think Chris will be the one to speak to the attorney. Okay. Mm -hmm. Unmute Janet. Oh, I've done that before with Chris on other issues like years ago, like kind of because it's like the attorney talk. It's like you kind of like you kind of run through this thing. So, right. I hear you. I just, I mean, typically, you know, because the town pays for the time of legal counsel, mm -hmm. um, we don't typically do that. So, um, let me. I would just check in with Chris about that. So at the very least, I would say if people, not everyone's going to be meeting with the town attorney unless really what you could do is just invite him back to a meeting. You know, maybe if you want to have him have him show up at a meeting and then people can ask their questions ahead of time and then he can respond to them in a meeting would probably make the most sense. Okay. Do okay. you think that's something that the town would be willing to spend? Having yeah, I, th I think we on? could bring him back in. If you have some very specific questions about, about that piece, it just makes sense to have him at the meeting. So everyone has an opportunity versus one or two members only having time with the attorney separately. Um, shall we, in the meantime, Stephanie, um, individually just feed you um, sure. some questions? Mm -hmm. uh, maybe CC Chris, but she's out for the moment. Yeah. She's going to be out for yeah, the next meeting as well. So if yeah. you want to start generating questions, I'll compile a list and get them together. I won't be at the next meeting either, but um, yeah. mm -hmm. if you want to start getting questions together. Yeah, I, I would suggest maybe waiting then until we're farther along with the draft. And then uh, then I think by that time, we just, we'd really have our, our, our questions really you know, concise. And, and straighten it out. And in the meantime, you know, when Chris gets back, uh, maybe she can talk to the attorney if we have a couple of specific things. But really, I think uh, now, you know, it's until Chris gets back, um, you know, then we'll get going step by step, marching through this whole draft now and trying to get each section really thought through and really right, um, step by step. I think we're about to that point. And maybe, uh, Dwayne, if we want to segue into the other agenda item, which was talking about, well, what are we going to do at our next meeting? Uh, you know, we had suggested that perhaps uh, since both Chris and Stephanie will, will not be there, we really wouldn't be making progress on the on the maps and the and the draft. But th that might be a good time to talk about the agrivoltaics and, and really try to get a good sense that we're all hearing uh, the same message about, you know, what are the pluses and minuses and how would be the best way to regulate it and so on. 
Um, yeah, we'll get to that in a moment. Um, yes, okay. I'm jumping ahead a little, I realize, but uh, okay. Um, okay, so um, any more comments on the nexus statements or the um, introduction, introduction purpose section um, or the outreach to the attorney? Um, no. Um, okay, so we will feed uh, Stephanie with any uh, questions around this structure of the of the uh, of the bylaw, um, and 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 sort of how these um, this these initial sections fit together, and and uh, uh, and sort of what's what's the um standard or or uh um optional ways in which uh, that can be structured together in a way that's um consistent with with uh the zoning documents uh as well as sort of sets it sets it up well in terms of um legal review uh and we'll get those to stephanie uh over the course of the of of the week though stephanie you're going to not be here at the next meeting either um uh but uh, maybe we can then the following meeting sort of have some feedback on that yeah i'll i can um i'll only be out the day of that meeting so oh, i'll be okay. here okay. the week before i'm not going on vacation okay. i'm just oh, taking okay, a day you. for something so okay. Okay. um so i it's just that one day so you can send me comments through the week okay okay sounds good and if you wanted, if you are going to have a meeting, I could compile the questions and send at least a draft of the questions for that next meeting ahead of time, if you if that would be helpful to you all. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, what questions about what? I kind of missed. <laughs> I think it was questions that we wanted to put in front of the town lawyer. Oh, okay. Sorry. Okay. Uh, the town council. Oh, well, the other town council. <laughs> I know. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, sounds good. Um, before we get to the uh, talking about the next meeting, um, I did just want to um, open up a little bit. It, it sounds like we will soon have the opportunity. Maybe it's not the next meeting because Stephanie won't be there, but maybe the next one. Uh, might have the opportunity to ha to uh, work ha hands on during the meeting uh, with the mapping uh, tool that um, the town has uh, is prepared, um, and it's going to be a tool in front of us. But it doesn't do anything unless we ask it to do something. Uh, <laughs> and so, um, you know, I thought it would be uh, maybe helpful at this point, uh, just being a bit prepared. We can continue this a bit next week as well, but. Um, be prepared to um uh to to to, to um think about ahead of time uh, what sort of queries or 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 maps we want to extract and and uh, and be able to see from this mapping tool um maybe maybe this will be an iterative process because i think we'll learn a lot more about the mapping tool um from uh from the presentation on it um when it becomes available uh and then we may better understand what are the what are the really the types of questions and and um analyses we can do with the tool uh but uh that being said um i'm just put it out there in terms of if there's any sort of thoughts or ideas of what are the types of things we would want to make use make this make use of this tool for um, and so that we can maybe, um, you know, be prepared to step through some of those things if they're simple enough uh, during the presentation and, and uh, early exercise uh, and training on the tool, uh, or then be prepared to do um, um, in between meetings and maybe maybe be prepared to present uh, at, at uh, subsequent meetings. So any thoughts, thoughts on that or ideas? Um, yeah, Janet. So um, one thing I wondered 
looking at the report was um, I'd like to know where the um, the locations of the transmission lines that can take capacity now are, and then um, ones that could be upgraded. So I know you know there was like two cuts on that, and I just wondered. Will we be able to say, oh, these transmission? I mean, I kind of know the transmissions lines. I live next to them, well, the but um, they're really big and they're really brown, you know. And so, but I, I wondered, you know, I wanted to be able to say, I, I really wanted to be able to look at parts of town and say, oh, the transmission line is here. Um, I'd like to get the Google Earth view because that's, you know, I kind of at least have that. That is super useful to me. When someone says bare ground, you could be like, well. Actually, that's a cornfield every other year or something like that, or not. And then, um, so I wanted to be able to look at the landscape as it is and houses and trees that are, you know, like when they say there's lawn, lots of us have lawns, but lots of us has trees. And I wondered how that was counted. And then um, I wanted to see the transmission lines that, you know, like they'll probably be upgraded in the future. And then I think, Stephanie, you said we could look at lot lines and stuff. Um, and then, the, you know, of course, the soils, things like that. Yeah. Will we, we will we be able to see the endangered species stuff or that's just off? It's already blocked off. That's just blocked off because it's, you know, again, this was just for where is it feasible? Could mm -hmm. could and so we'll be able to see what's on the ground and then it's locked knocked off or do you know what I mean? Like so when you have the map, there'll be a whole section that will be just basically identified as being sort of not feasible, right? That's if you yeah. want to break it down to the most simplest bare bones, look at the map. It's like, this is feasible. These are areas that are feasible. This is not. So anything blocked off in black is not feasible. So, so one of the things I wondered about was I know Hampshire college is selling some land next to Atkins, right? And since it's Hampshire college land, that would be not feasible, right? Or it's not feasible. It's just not included so Correct. i wonder if those kind of plots could i be like oh you know hampshire college on um, trying to get my directions east of 116 they were going to do meridian village they own a lot of land they're obviously not using so could i could we look at that land anyway even though it's amherst college i mean hampshire college land like or is that you have maybe not with this tool i don't think you'll be able to um look at the areas that are blocked off uh -huh. um, because the base map is the one that GZA provided. So if they blocked it off, that's kind of the base map. But okay. you can always go onto the town. The town's map is available all the time. Okay. And you can always go to the town's map. I mean, what might be nice is like if you kind of did a side by side and things are changing all the time. I mean, you're going to come up with this for, you know, the information is as good as the information that we have at the present time. So some of this is going to change over time and it's not always going to be, you know, there might be, I talked to Mike about that, you know, there might be some updates that he might do, but, you know, it's only going to be as good as when it was updated in that moment. So, yeah. you know, but, and that might, that's a great example, you know, if some land suddenly comes out of, you know, the, the, um, institutions of higher education's portfolio and suddenly it's available for sale, you know, that might not be reflected on this map, but you can certainly, I think once you have some familiarity with this tool, it'll make it easier to like piece it together through other layers from other sources. Yeah, and I, I, um, I guess a, a couple things when I, um, I'm a little bit, I'm not sure if we're comfortable sort of going parcel by parcel on, on private property parcels and sort of look at it at that scale um, uh, because we're not developers we're we're, um, we're regulators trying to find trends and, um, and and sort of rules rules to guide the the developers in, in certain directions uh, and I'd be a little bit concerned to sort of throw up a map map and start looking at you know person X's uh, property and come to some opinions about whether that's a good site for solar or not um, that being said, um, um, we may, you know, it may be just natural to do some of that because you're kind of, you know, working around seeing where, where, um, where the, but I think we want to work more sort of statistically and analytically and look at trends as opposed to sort of individual parcels is, is my sense. Uh, but then, um, Wayne, we're but, making a, we are going to make a priority map. That's part of our job. So I, I you know, I'm not saying we're going to tell 
Hampshire College to sell this land, but I'm just saying is we are putting together a map saying these are the priority sites for solar. So I think we do have to look at parcels. The other question I had is my Jack Jemsek question is, will we be able to look at the open space recreation plan or sites? Can you do an overlay for that? Because I know Jack kept on bringing that up. Yeah, I mean, that's what, what I was going to raise. I, you know, I'd like to sort of see a mapping that looks at all the feasible, if solar feasible land, but then an overlay of, okay, what is currently in conservation um, oh, by the wow, town? Wow. Say that, Robert. Nothing. Okay, it's, sorry. I, it, it's already, I think that's already taken account for. So yeah. conservation land is blacked out. Yeah. That's uh -huh. already taken. So when you look at that base map, it's okay. going to be blocked out already. Yeah, can we look, Can but I guess maybe going back to the original map, um, and not the blacked out map, which may not differentiate between different reasons why it's blacked out. Um, I would like to get a sense of, of um, you know, the, ex the extent of the Amher town of Amherst um, conservation land um, that we we already have taken off the map, if you will, but to look at that. Uh, to get a sense of where that is, um, how extensive that is, how that's contributing to our health, wealth, health, safety, and welfare uh, by providing the services that it does. Okay, um, so that's a different map. That's yeah, okay. the map that that's the existing. Like you have access yeah, to that information that right. today. Yeah, you could go on the town's GIS, you know, mapping. Yeah, but I think it's it's part of what a store, the part of the story we want to tell collectively as, as one. You know, you know, I'm seeing a series of maps uh, that sort of weaves together the story of uh, that deals with these nexus statements. Okay, we want to preserve health, safety, and welfare. That includes recreation land. We've done some. We've done some of that. We've done conservation land. We have that. Um, you know, because. Um, you know, then the question is, do we do more uh, or is that enough um, and, and so forth. And so I think that's part of, of the story uh, we want to be able to unfold uh, and think about as we're developing the, the restrictions as well as the nexus statements. Uh, but I get you, Stephanie, that that's actually already um, available to us. But um, I'm just thinking more of the context of everything put together. Okay, that this is a, maybe a a different conversation and i think yeah. it would be helpful to have chris here for this yeah. conversation because i'm really honestly don't think there's additional mapping that's coming um so if you're talking about something specifically that you all want to see i think that has to be a, another conversation yeah okay okay uh, but you're saying that um we we have access to do that ourselves anyhow um and so um um absolutely yeah okay absolutely yeah okay great um yeah martha yes so so following up on on what you've been saying duane i agree that it would be helpful to then you know see a a different map that that showed the use of the sections that were blacked out uh and maybe it's possible even in one of our discussions downstream we'd have two side by side we'd have the one that shows the blacked out map and then we'd have the conservation map that shows ah it was that those reasons were conservation land and i would also uh like to see just for you know instruction purposes uh that supplied to the <coughs> to the college lands, because, you know, as we all know, an awful lot of our land area is blocked out by our large universities and uh, two private colleges. And it would be interesting to see, say for Hampshire College, which has, you know, lots, lots of open land, uh, to just to see the map that shows well how much of the land is open or fields or or this or that you know you see sheep grazing as you drive down 116 there and you think gee you know this be a good place for uh dual use solar right over the sheep and uh so on so i i think it would be helpful to at least see that at one point on a map and as you say Dwayne, the conservation some of the other uses so we get kind of a side-by-side -side picture of of our land area and uh okay what are the regions for for solar and uh 
uh, along the you know, prime soils and so on. But I think that's all going to come as we get into the mapping and we, we have Chris and hopefully uh, maybe Mike uh, Warner and Stephanie all kind of uh, helping us to display the maps in a, in a meeting here. Yeah. Great, Stephanie. Um, I just wanted to say that I think when we were developing the map, there might be some um, inability to access some of the information about the transmission line locations um, because they're the utility company and that's not readily available to the general public. Some of that information, I don't, I can't recall specifically what it was. And Dwayne, you might recall the conversation we had with Adrian during one of our meetings, but they as a consultant had access to information, but the general public doesn't. So they couldn't be specific. So I don't know that we will have as detailed information as you might be looking for. Mm -hmm. right, yeah, yeah. And these would be more the distribution lines, I think, than the transmission lines. Mm -hmm. But it's the tr transmission lines that matter for, for large scale development, right? Well, no, we, know, we pretty much know that the transmission runs, you know, north and south through town. Through town. Yeah. So it's pretty, that's why we were saying, like, in, when they were, when we were doing this mapping exercise, access to the transmission lines is pretty much anywhere in town because it's, you know, you're within a few miles or less of getting to the transmission lines. Yeah, but I, th I think typically the solar projects, um, you know, unless they're like tens of megawatts, um, would in, uh, interconnect on the distribution lines, mm -hmm. uh, the three, you know, the three phase distribution lines, um, yeah. which I think um, um, GZA looked at, but but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit unclear in terms of what the public view of that will be. Okay, all right. Well, this has been helpful uh, just to sort of think this through a bit um, as we um, start to take a look at the maps in the coming weeks. Um, okay, any other thoughts on that? All right, great. Let's um, then... Uh, yeah, talk about the next meeting. Um, we are expecting a quorum, uh, is from what I understand, um, in terms of vacations and so forth, but um, a lack of of a staff, uh, uh, which is logistically not a problem or legally not a problem. Um, Stephanie will be able to set us up with somebody else to help conduct the meeting, uh, at least the Zoom, the Zoom part of it. Um, and uh, so the idea was to, and Chris won't be here, but uh, but um, use some of that time to um, uh, um, the one suggestion that's been on the table has been uh, to bring in some guest speakers um, or guest speaker. Um, the agrivoltaic area is one issue. Um, I am prepared to reach out to Jake Marley. Um, to ask him if he's available, if that's of interest. Um, um, uh, but I think we would also want to um, uh, see who else might be able to, might be uh, appropriate speakers on on um, on dual use uh, or other topics. Uh, Janet. So. You're you're doing your institute um, is doing kind of is doing a series of meetings on this issue for Western Mass. So, are there people, um, you know, from like CISA or NOFA or some you know farm organizations that could come in and talk about solar and farming and dual use? Are there farmers specifically who are doing dual use right now? Like, can we? I you know. I, you know, I have I keep on offering Fred Bettel who has his slideshow, but um, you know, I could also ask him just to send me the slideshow to see if I think it's useful and I could send that along to you. Um, but I, I think it'd be, you know, like if we can kind of um use the people that you're reaching out to, um, if we can get like a few guest speakers in that list, it'd be great. Yep. Uh we 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 haven't really put together a speaker list for the uh fall forum that we're uh developing um and that's not specifically on or, or not specifically on agrivoltaics but a range of of issues that we're all talking about anyhow um on on solar and siting and so forth um uh 
but yes, in addition, I, I mean, two organizations come to mind. Um, we work closely with AFT, American Farmland Trust. They do a lot of work on agrivoltaics um, um, across the country, but no, uh, locally as well. Um, and then um, as part of our DOE research grant, we do have a steering committee and I'm blocking offhand on the person's name from, um, I think it's um, NOFA, uh, but I'd have to double check. Uh, but we do have a steering committee member who might be a, a, a person I could call on to see if they're available. Also, what is, I always forget CISA and NOFA, like I've used, so Northeast yes. Association and Community in Support community. of Agriculture. <laughs> Community I, I, engaged I, I, in sustainable agriculture or community engaged. Yeah. No, no. Okay. Yeah. Get one. Okay. Yeah. I think actually, I think our steering committee member is C, is in, on CISA. NOFA is, is uh, specifically organic farming. Okay. That'd be great. Okay. Um, yep. This would be for um, two weeks from today. Yeah. 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 That sounds that sounds interesting. I think I think we could all uh, learn a lot from from that and uh, uh I think if some local farmers would be able to uh you know at least uh, attend and uh you know make any comments from their side I think might be helpful after the hearing the presentations and but I think we'd we'd all feel better educated if we have all that in public, and then we'd kind of have a good sense of how to write whatever we want to do about uh, the you know, regulations for the agricultural land, or what to say about the uh, dual use and so on. So thank you. All right, I think we want to, um, and I I'll have to check with Jake if he's able to talk about this. But um, you know, the state has. Uh, very detailed regulations with regard to agrivoltaic installations um, if you want to get the incentive, um, the yeah. smart incentive, the adder, which typically it'd be yeah. hard pressed to do a project without that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so, that would be helpful. Yeah. Um, so that would be uh, uh, something I could see if uh, Jake yeah. could handle. That'd be great. Yeah. yeah. Good, good. <laughs> um, Stephanie. Yeah, I just wanted to suggest that if you want to do this more like, and I know Martha, you've brought this up before. If you want to do it more like an education series where you're actually providing this as an opportunity for experts to come in and for farmers to come and join the meeting and ask questions, I think you would want to put it on the agenda that way because this isn't public comment. This is a very specific educational format. So it's different. It's not, you don't yeah. typically in the middle of a meeting allow public comment and feedback, right? You have two, you have a very dedicated opportunity for the public to provide comment. Otherwise, you're doing your business of trying to create the solar bylaw. So, but if this is a sort of different format that you want to do for this meeting as an educational opportunity, then we should. Um, someone could put together a flyer once you know who your speakers are going to be, and we would want to get that information out. And you'd probably want to do that sooner than later so that we can get it out on our social media, um, put it on the town's website, and um, and post it as such. Yeah, that would be good. Just the way you were doing for with the ECAC and the uh, and the heat pumps and Right, because that's an yeah. educational series aimed at the public. So they're not necessarily doing their business of deliberating over yeah. initiatives. They're just providing information for the general public um, and offering that as an opportunity for people to hear from experts and ask questions. So, um, I, I mean, I know that you're doing a very specific thing in developing a solar bylaw, but maybe this one meeting is a one-off where you do it as an educational opportunity. Yeah, it's it's kind of a it's a hybrid, so to speak. It's for our information in this case, but also I think it would be helpful to uh, to make it more of an open opportunity for the public, as Stephanie suggests. I think that's a good idea. What um, I, I, my main hesitation is that I'm 
uh, <laughs> vacation next week <laughs> in terms of pulling this all together. Um, uh, yeah. Which I can certainly reach out to the speakers that I mentioned um, today or, or or Monday or something to see if we have a a, 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 a quorum of good speakers. Um, and I don't I don't want to over do it, but I'm thinking of somebody, Jake, if he's available, somebody from AFT and somebody from CISA, for example. Um, I think, truthfully, I, from my perspective, that's a little bit more helpful than having uh, sort of just farmers who want to uh, um, state their perspectives or thoughts, uh, though I do like the idea of then having the the farming community or any anybody uh, to then engage in a bit of an educational dialogue with the speakers yeah. and ourselves um, after that. So, um, I mean, I'm good with um, inviting the speakers and trying to get those speakers uh, available this time, um, say for the first hour, uh, particularly of the of the meeting next week. Um, but um, could use uh, some help in terms of um, um, outreach. Um, uh, I'm not sure if there's a. Um, uh, a particularly good outreach up, uh, avenue for the farming community in Amherst. Um, some of our speakers may know, yep. um, but- um, I, could, I could tap into my ultimate Frisbee farmers who seem to know everybody. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and, and Dave Zomax. Strange uh, overlap between farming and ultimate Frisbee. I don't understand it, but- yeah. Okay, there, there's a correlation. Yes, yeah, so it, it sounds yeah, like I guess Dave Zomac would be. Uh, it would be might be causation. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Wayne, it sounds like if you can provide, uh, you know, confirmation that yes, we'll have speakers. We just give it a general title and say, you know, there will be open for a question and answer set at the end. And um, you know, Stephanie, if you need help, uh, it sounds like the rest of us would be able to help publicize it to uh, groups that that we know whenever you'd like us to help. I think what would be helpful is if someone generated the flyer. Okay. Um, well, why and, don't you but we need out, the speakers. Yeah. yeah, send out the information then as soon as, Dwayne, as soon as you have it and give it to Stephanie. Stephanie, send out the information and maybe some of us will um, try our hand at a flyer. <laughs> All right. All right, sounds good. Yeah. Um, all right. Any other comments on or thoughts on that for the next the next meeting? All right, super. Okay. Um let's um I mean, can I ask a question? Yeah. So it seems like this could be a really good discussion and it could take up the whole meeting. Is there anything else that we need to talk about at the next meeting? Because we won't have any bylaw. Is there some other um, burnt issue we could put in there or? <laughs> um, yeah, okay. So in terms of any other agenda topics, I mean, I think we could have this presentation and, and, and uh, community Q&A and so forth. And then, um, and that for, and formally end that process and then go into um, more uh, discussion about what what did we learn from all that with regard to the bylaw uh, um, uh, and sort of set that up for uh, then working with Christine when she's back um, on 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 um, on what what that section might start to look like uh, is one thought. Okay. Stephanie. So um this will still officially be a meeting so yeah. you're still going to have an agenda and a meeting yeah. format yeah so i would say that if you you know with the ecac what they typically do is they do their business in the first hour and then in the second hour is when they have the presentation and public comment um or question and answer period at the end of that if you want to sort of do this differently and start the meeting with an educational event and then sort of launch into the meeting at the end, you'll just want to be really cognizant of your time to allow for the format of the rest of the meeting. So you'll want to make sure that it starts at 1130 and ends at 1230 if you decide that it's going to be an hour. Um, so is I'm trying to remember uh, if we want to sort of spend the full two hours and we don't need to spend the full two hours. Um, 
if we want to take a little bit of a shorter meeting. Uh, but if we did want to spend the full two hours, I mean, in my mind, it might make sense to hear the presentations first, hear some of the comments first, and then and then have that to deliberate as a as a work back as a working group. Though we may have a larger audience audience listening to us, which would be fine. Um, to um, then talk a little bit uh, uh, as, as the working group on what we learned from that. Um, so that would be your agenda item. So your agenda item would first yeah. be the presentation with Q&A identified as part of the subject mm -hmm. line for that session. Um, but then you're going to be going into your discussion afterwards, which would not have public comment. Yeah. You would just have your staff, your group yeah. committee discussion would be the second half of that meeting. And With then you'd have public comment, comment period at the very end as you normally yeah, do. Yeah, yeah. But I don't think one would necessarily have to put in the agenda the a time limit. So that Dwayne, you could decide if if the experts were saying some really interesting things or the comments were very interesting, that you you could have your discretion at the time to allow it to go somewhat longer than an hour if you know if you thought it was being fruitful, you know, without having to have a strict cutoff in the agenda, would that be okay? I think Stephanie's worried about like the public noticing of when we're doing a dis yeah. the working group being discussion. So my guess would be, you know, every speaker that we've had singly has talked for, we've talked with them for like an hour. So I would do an hour and a half if we have several speakers and for comment, and then say the last half hour is our discussion. And I, I, I think it wouldn't be bad I mean, if, if it was like this amazing discussion and everybody had comments, it wouldn't be bad for us to say, okay, we're going to, we're going to do our discussion at the next meeting. But I think we do have to notice the time that we're as a group meeting. I think that's what, I think that's what Stephanie is worrying about. I'm just worrying about getting the agenda to cover what you're going to discuss. And then also you want to make sure that you leave time. I mean, there's Q and A that's part of this educational event, but then you want to leave time for public comment at the end of the meeting, like you always oh, okay. do. Okay. So you need to make sure that you have that time identified, you know, and leave that time. So if you're going to have a discussion, 50 minutes of you all having discussion with potentially 15 minutes of public comment might not be enough. So you might want to limit it to the hour. Um, well, well, let's 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 wait and see. Why don't you, Dwayne, why don't you see about who you get for speakers and, you know, ponder it over the weekend and. Um, okay. and we'll yeah, yeah, I'm not I'm not opposed to, um, you know, just having the extent of the meeting of this public education thing uh, and then uh, and then. Um, the next meeting we discuss what we learned yeah. um and and, and, and just, that would yeah that would, ends it ends. yeah okay i think that makes more sense yeah because the q a then you don't have to sort of set aside a time it just sort of happens as you naturally go along and yeah, yeah. um so we would probably notice this public event i mean obviously it's all it, it's all, still a meeting it's, it's still, still going to be a meeting because you're a forum so it an has educational to be yeah. education event with q a right. uh from 11 30 um can we say till one o'clock? Yeah. Um, and that, that would be the extent of the meeting. Okay. Uh, and, and I guess we would have, you know, the, the presentations, Q and a, um, and then, um, and then just uh, public comment after that for any, you know, public comment that related to that or, or related to other things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it will still be things like review of the minutes from today's meeting uh -huh. will show up, but you don't have to do it. You just, okay. but we do have to sort of note it. Oh, it's okay. still going to be a meeting format. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. It still has to be because you're a quorum. We yeah. ha still have to notice it and do all of the things yeah, that we yeah, normally yeah. do, but it'll just show up as it'll say educational event, mm -hmm. whatever we title, mm -hmm. title that to be, and then who will be speaking and mm -hmm. then that it will be followed by Q and a. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it will still have next meeting schedule and agenda items it'll still have public comment okay and adjourn but but it doesn't, i, can, I you know, can say that we're going to do the educational event first right uh and then um state that we didn't get to the other agenda items we'll kick them to the next meeting correct yeah and so then stephanie or Dwayne, whichever one of you then communicates the agenda and so on to our our solar bylaw working group please do stress then that this is an official meeting and we need a quorum so yes. You know, yep. urge urge all seven of our members to try to attend. Okay. Right now, you all said that you, I mean, if if everyone sticks to what they sent me, you uh -huh. have a quorum. Yes, you okay. should have a quorum at that meeting. 
but we wouldn't okay. want to give the impression to anybody that this was instead of a regular no. meeting. Okay. It'll show up, and that's why I'm saying it's yes. going to be okay. formatted like a regular meeting. It'll okay. look, the agenda will look like it always does. It's just that it's going to say educational event, but okay. it's still going to look like the same agenda. Great. Right. Yeah. Good. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Thank, <laughs> thanks, Stephanie. Um, sure. You're keeping us in line, Stephanie. <laughs> I try, um, but but all contingent on me uh, wrangling these speakers. Right. So if you get, you know, that's the one thing is okay. we need to make sure you have your speakers. <laughs> Great. <clears throat> all right. Good. Um, let's move on then uh, to um, close out the meeting first with uh, any comments from the public, uh, and we do have um, uh, four folks uh, on on participating with us today. So thank you for that. So if anyone has any comments or questions for the committee, could you please electronically raise your hand to speak? <clears throat> okay, Eric, you can go ahead and unmute. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, thank you all for your continued um, hard work on a very difficult um, but critically important um, topic for the town and for the world. Um, I've been uh, following um, meetings um, regarding the cl climate mitigation for many years, um, uh, starting initially with the uh, with um, with ECAC, um, and I wonder. Uh, my question or observation is more about process. Um, uh, early on in the um, um, in ECAC's existence, the Niche report was released, and it identified quite a number of acres of available um, rooftops as well as uh, brownfields that could be developed. And I'm wondering what, how, how the town could proactively embark on um, deploying solar. I mean, uh, 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 my wife and I have a very tiny array on our roof. Um, and since 2014, um, the reports that we get daily, or as if we wanted to, um, uh, indicate that that this tiny array has already um, uh, reduced 130,000 pounds of CO2 uh, uh, has um, has um, um, captured 130 uh, the equivalent of 130,000 pounds of 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 CO2 has saved 80 trees. So I'm imagining the the acres and acres that were identified, oh, I would say four years ago, if they were fully deployed, how many millions of thou, uh, um, pounds of CO2 would have been captured? How many hundreds and hundreds, thousands of trees have been saved? I'm wondering how the town would, would uh, proactively embark on deploying solar on already identified uh, roofs and brownfields. I guess is that me? I guess that's kind of me. <laughs> well, also I mean, maybe I comment don't... from uh, from ECAC, um, and I'm not sure, Eric, if you were at the meeting yes yesterday. I uh, was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there was some discussion about um, uh, a role that ECAC can play. Um, you know, while we're developing these and um, separate from, but but related to you know developing these these zoning bylaws and so forth, which is the purview of this committee, and is really more focused on ground mounted array arrays. Um, what uh, what might be a role for ECAC uh, to help um, move forward the opportunities for uh, the built environment, um, and uh, so that you, you might have recognize that in the discussion yes, yesterday, uh, there wasn't sort of a um, discussion about specific actions, but that is a topic that sort of teed up for ECAC uh, to, to uh, uh, start thinking about. So um, that's one thing, but maybe Stephanie has has some uh, thoughts, uh, certainly on the town, town properties. Yeah, I was just gonna say that I think, um, you know, as with anything, one of it becomes um, investigating where we can, um, achieve the greatest good with the most economically. So, um, and 
we've had that report for a little while, but that was a very, the niche report was very, very limited in scope. I mean, it does identify some areas, but we don't really have a lot of brownfields in Amherst. And so we don't, I think part of the problem with things like when you identify parking lots, we understand that we could build parking canopies. But when we discuss that, when it comes up, it's often um, very cost prohibitive. And it's not as straightforward, like even, so for instance, I'll just throw in an example is like the parking lot in front of town hall is at a slope. It doesn't look it, but it is for a solar, you know, for a solar canopy. So um, that requires a lot more cost to sort of make that an even grade. So these kinds of questions come up. So it's not that the town never looks at these reports. It's just that in the scheme of trying to look at everything as a where we where do we allocate our funding, it, it becomes a bit of a challenge. So I think we're also, um, with this solar assessment and the development of the solar bylaw, I think we're in a different place and at a different time. Um, that's sort of more, um, trying to get more of a handle on to what you said about prioritizing, you know, and sort of looking at the town from that perspective. And with the ECAC support, I think that's kind of like the next step. Great. Um, uh, Janet, did you have a comment on that? Um, one was just that I'd love to see the niche report. Um, and then also, I think I think Eric might be talking about how to get other like individuals or companies um, to deploy solar on rooftops and stuff. I'm just guessing it wasn't just town properties. Yeah, that, I mean, and that's um, what ECAC was talking. We didn't go into any details, but for the ECAC, um, you know, we don't have any particular um, rules and regulations, but, you know, we do do um, look to do public outreach and, and education and so forth. And uh, so our purview would not be limited to town owned properties, but, um, but the constituents in Amherst. Yeah, I, I guess my concern is that once a bylaw is uh, written, it really, I, it, it certainly codifies what a, what a private landowner and a private developer can do. And I'm just wondering how the town as an entity that has uh, has potential to deploy, how it can proactively engage in, uh, in utilizing what we already know exists and have that we can and that, we, that we can control. So it's, it's, um, it's a question of what what is the town capable of embarking on uh, um, uh, um, uh, climate mitigation pro projects, or is it really are we looking at um, uh, uh, corporate America, corporate in, uh, to to do it for us? Is my, my question. We've already identified in the niche report that there was a brownfield across from the Hampshire admissions office on east of 116, a large tract of land that I think in the report indicated it was a former gas station or had some kind of blighted um, blight problem. Um, um, uh, so um, where wh it's we're four years down the road and as I indicated, just as a per, as a private land uh, house owner, and with a tiny rooftop solar, uh, we've been able to stave off eighty trees are being stave off cutting of eighty trees, and also sequestering one hundred thirty thousand pounds of CO two. And I can't imagine what if you multiply this tiny tiny postage stamp part of an acre on a roof, what that what it would look like, we would have magnified that project. So I mean, it's really a question of, you know, can the town, does the town have the ability to uh, uh, proactively uh, develop um, solar projects or are we relying on uh, uh, corporate America, private landowners to do it for us? I, I would, point out and, and all good points eric uh, appreciate that but i would point out that uh between the landfill project and the hickory ridge project coming which were proactively done by the town that's uh, I, I i suspect is the majority of solar capacity we have in the in the town 
Um, so um, those two projects um, are what probably 10 megawatts in total uh, of the 20, 25 or 27, I think, megawatts that we have in town. Um, and so there has been that proactivity by the town to stimulate and, 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 and facilitate those projects. Thank you. Which took a long, I mean, not Hickory Ridge, but we all know the story of the landfill that took a long time. Hopefully they won't all be that difficult. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> Sorry. I just want to jump in to, to respond to Eric that the CCA may address some of this once it's um, once it's actually um, been, the application's been accepted by DPU and once it hopefully gets approved, we assume that it will. And I know it's a few days on the road, but you know, um, one of the goals of the group has been, the, the three communities has been to have a joint powers entity that would house that program within it so that it might allow for some projects like microgrid development um, of renewable energy resources, not only solar, but, you know, potentially others. So that's kind of one of the missions of that work as well. Great. All right. Thank you. Um, any other comments from the partic public participants? Great, seeing none. Um, any um, final comments or thoughts from the group? Uh, otherwise, we'll end a bit early. Seeing none, um, I propose we adjourn. <laughs> any objections? <laughs> okay, thanks everybody. And we'll be in touch uh, and, and look out for e emails and updates on the uh, speak uh, potential speakers for next uh, next meeting. All right, thanks all. Thank you, have a fun weekend. Enjoy, yeah, enjoy the long weekend, yep. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.